I'm back. Oh my God. Cox, I'm telling you. Not a good, not a good internet thing. Anyway, okay, so what was I talking about? I was talking about, um, and I've lost all the questions. Yay. So, um, okay, so this is part two of, of the boundaries thing because I lost everybody um, because my stupid internet connection. Thank you guys. <laughs> Ask your questions again because I don't have them now because now I'm on a new feed. Um, so this video is for educational and informational purposes only. If you feel you need a therapist, go to Google, type in therapy psychology today. will pop up, click on that. It'll have all the videos. Also the views and opinions stated here under my mind alone. Don't represent the ACA or APA or anybody else for that damn matter. Boom. I hate Cox. Anyway. Um, all right. So anyway, um, question, question, question. What was I working on? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Gray rocking. So, um, prepare to gray rock, prepare to change the subject. You know, how about them Dodgers? you know, or whatever. You don't want to talk about serious stuff because that's just an end for them. And they will absolutely use whatever you say against you. So you don't want to do that. Okay. So you can leave. You don't have to stay. And the biggest thing is, is that boundaries are very much connected with self-esteem. Absolutely. So people who have got good self-esteem have good boundaries and they don't mind when people say no. Okay. Question. Here we go. What to say to parents who say I did everything for you and gave you money and now you can sacrifice for me too. Oh, that's a big one. All right. Listen to me now. Believe me later. Love is supposed to be unconditional, but in dysfunctional families, it's a tool. Money is a tool. And I've talked about this in other videos. Money is a tool used to string people along. There's strings attached. Okay. It's not unconditional. It's conditional. So what you want to do is, you know, you just ignore it. You ignore it. It's not your job. When you're a parent, you're supposed to sacrifice for your children. Your children are supposed to come first. Okay. So it just, mm, dog face, banana patch. Oh my God. Mm. So yeah, they will use money as a guilt manipulation thing. So either the money is given freely or it's not. If it's not given freely, give it back to them. Here's a check. Here you go. No strings attached. There you go. Now they have nothing on you. Do you see where I'm going with that? So, um, yeah, that's, that's a manipulation. That's an absolute manipulation, especially if they're like, well, you have to be here. You know, we did so much for you, you know, martyr, 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 which is part of that, uh, hermit borderline thing. The hermits tend to be the martyrs. Um, and then with the covert narcissist, that's that whole victim, victim, victim thing. Look at me. I'm the victim, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to play that game. You don't have to play that game. Again, ask yourself the question. If you were not related to them, would you have anything to do with them? If the answer is no, then don't go. If you really feel the need, pay them back. And then they have nothing on you. So there that is. How is a malignant borderline different from a malignant narcissist? Would a borderline be less likely to abandon their target? So, oh, that's a, you know, that's a really good question. So what I have seen, okay, in, in dysfunctional relationships, it's in abusive relationships with a narcissist. Narcissists love two types of people. They either love the empaths or they love the borderlines. And oftentimes borderlines are very empathic. So what they do is they go for the borderline because the borderline is terrified of abandonment. And then they just torture them, torture them, torture them, torture them, torture them. I'm going to leave you. 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 Don't leave me. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Freak out. Freak out. Freak out. Narcissistic supply. Oh, baby, I love you. Oh, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to leave you. I'm going to leave you. Freak out, freak out, freak out. Narcissistic supply. Oh, I'm going to stay. Oh, I'm going to leave you. You know, they, they torture the, the borderline in that case. Uh, oh my God. So, um, so they also go for empaths, people who are not borderline, but are very empathic and have codependency issues because they want somebody to caretake them. So, okay. Um, I hope that answered that question, but, um, no, hold on. I wanted to make sure I got that one completely. Hang on. Um, so a malignant borderline and a malignant narcissist, you have to remember. So everything is on a scale. So down here is the lower end over here is the high end at the malignant end of it. As people become malignant, literally every single personality disorder starts overlapping. And it's really hard to tell what the heck's going on unless you really sit down and really work through what's happening with them. Um, this is another reason why I am not thrilled with what I see happening. They're trying very hard to get rid of, of personality disorders in the DSM because they don't want to label people and they don't want to hurt people and da, 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 da. I'm sorry, you cannot hurt a narcissist. There, <laughs> there is no there there. 
got to say that again. So, you know, and they're like, well, we don't want to label people and da, 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 da. But it's very helpful for the targets of abuse to know, oh, this is what's going on. This is what is happening. And this is, you know, not normal. And wow, I'm not the only person that this has happened to. So, um, yeah, so borderlines are less likely to abandon them. That's why narcissists love to get with them. So yeah, there is that. And the borderlines are very sensitive, very sensitive. They have the empath, empath, empathy, empathy, empathy when they're down at the lower end of the spectrum. Once they reach the queen and the witch, not so much. But down at the lower end of the spectrum, they have a great deal of empathy. And um, their, their thinking is not quite as chaotic, but when it gets up to the witch and the queen, it's completely disordered. So, okay, I hope that answered the question. Um, please talk a little bit about the mirror work regarding three things we do each day. I can't seem to find anything good I do. Okay, you woke up, you're breathing, you're on this planet, you're a child of the universe, boom. There you go. Keep going. Uh, you are kind and empathic. You are, you know, whatever, you know, there's lots of good about us people. It's just that we have not told ourselves that we've been looking for other esteem because we've always looked to our caregivers to tell us that we're good. But if we've got caregivers that are abusive, they're not going to tell us we're good, even if we are. So we have to start telling ourselves that we're good. Now, in the beginning, you're not going to believe it. You're not. Just point blank. That little voice is going to pop up and go, oh my God, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You're not good. You're not this. You're not, you're not enough. Blah, 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 blah. You have to shut that voice down and go, thank you for your input. Shut the fuck up. Why? Because I say so. You say so. I'm the boss, not you. And then you replace it immediately with the polar opposite. So let's say it did the whole, you're not good enough. There's nothing good about you. Shut the fuck up. Why? Because I say so. There's a lot good about me. I just probably don't know what it is yet, but there is a lot of good about me. Do you see how I did that? So that's what you have to do. You have to replace the negative with a positive. And if we didn't learn what self-esteem was from our parents, that's when you get the self-esteem workbook by Sheraldi. That's when you work on the inner child. That's when you work on uh, boundaries with uh, the disease to please. Do you see where I'm going with that? We have to reparent ourselves. You speak to yourself the way you wish your parents had spoken to you, like a healthy parent. Like how would a healthy parent speak to you? <gasps> Hi, good to see you again. Oh my gosh, three things you did right today. Here are three things. Oh my gosh, you got up this morning. You're on the right side of the turf. You're a child of the universe. Good to see you. Have a great day. That's how a good parent speaks to their children. That's how a good parent relates to their, their world, you know? So you reparent yourself the way you wished you had been parented. Not the way you were parented, but the way you wished you had been parented. So that's the way to do that. Okay. Um, I can't give the money back because it was for supporting my education. Okay. Well, in that case, you also don't allow them to use the money as a, um, as a manipulation, you know, as a, as a control issue. You just, you know, point blank. It's like, well, thank you so much. And when I have the ability to pay you back, I will. But right now I'm not coming over. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. You know, you just, you don't give into it, hon. They're going to come up with a hundred thousand million reasons why you're wrong. So you just let them think that you're wrong. It's, it's, they're going to think whatever they're going to think. You can't control it. What they think of you is none of your business. Self-esteem is where it comes in. It's like, do you deserve to be treated poorly? If the answer is yes, you need to work on your self-esteem. If the answer is no, good self-esteem and don't go be someplace where you're going to be treated poorly. Does that make sense? Um, okay. Can all of the cluster B behavior be a side effect of paranoid schizophrenia? No, two different, two different diagnoses guys. So Paranoid schizophrenia is a brain chemistry issue like nobody's business. So there is the 23rd genome in the brain gets toggled and suddenly the brain is unable to um, process the information coming in. So normally a brain would go, you know, connection A, connection B, connection A, connection B. What happens in schizophrenia, it's like all of a sudden connection A, connection B, connection F over to the lamppost outside and the moon and uh, the dog down the street. It's like the connections are just scrambled and they're not making correct inferences for the incoming information. So the 23rd genome is to blame for that. So um, it, it's a brain chemistry issue. Okay. And what medication does for that is it just quiets down the voices because literally in every single case of schizophrenia that I have seen paranoid schizophrenia or any kind of schizophrenia, and there is 
command, um, command hallucinations going on. So command hallucinations are when a voice in your head says, you have to go hit that guy right now. He's talking about you. That's a command hallucination. Okay. So usually there's like one on one side. That's just, you know, vicious and mean and nasty and everybody's out to get you. And this person's talking about you and you need to go hit them and da, 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 da. And then there's another one that's like, Hey, everything's wonderful. This is a great day. Blah, 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 blah. And you've got both of them screaming at you and at each other. And then imagine having a police officer coming up and giving you commands to get on the ground and put your hands on your head. This is why so many mentally ill people die. Um, <laughs> don't get me started. Um, especially in jurisdictions where they don't do enough training on mental illness, because if they are having command hallucinations, they are unmedicated. These voices, I'm not kidding you, are yelling at like full volume, like ah! all the time. Okay. I'm not kidding you. That's what they're hearing in their head. Okay. That level, that loud, one good, one bad all the time. There's no way uh, somebody in front of them can be giving them uh, a command, you know, get on the ground, put your hands on your head, and they're going to respond to it because they're too busy listening to the yelling match going on in their head. And you can always tell because their eyes go to whichever side is talking. They're, they're listening to, to which channel is talking. <sighs> anyway, it's horrible. Schizophrenia, I would not wish on my worst enemy, honestly. I had an uncle that had schizophrenia, and the poor guy just suffered his entire life. I mean, just horribly. And he was always in trouble with the law because he was always beating people up because he was convinced they were talking about him, even though they were on the other side of the street having a conversation with somebody else, you know? So that's what that is. Um, no, cluster B is not a side effect. Cluster B is something completely different. Um, PTSD is also something completely different. So post-traumatic stress disorder, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, complex, all complex means is, is it happens over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. The symptoms of complex post-traumatic stress disorder are nightmares, inability to sleep, poor sleep, uh, disrupted sleep, uh, flashbacks, intrusive thoughts, uh, irritability, um, uh, some paranoid ideation, dissociation, you know, things like that. Cluster Bs are completely different depending on what we're talking about. If we're talking about narcissism, it's a sense of entitlement. It's a sense of especially uh, favorable behavior, you know, being, being acknowledged for things that you didn't do, you know, like people who claim that they're in the military when they're not, you know, that type of thing. Um, that's narcissism. Borderline is this fear of abandonment. It's this terrified fear of abandonment and, you know, the frantic efforts to avoid abandonment and all the mis, mis, uh, sort of like maladaptive ways of trying to keep from getting abandoned. So we're talking apples and oranges here, totally different things. The totally different. If you want to know more, you can always run out and find a copy of the DSM five and look up all of the diagnoses and what's going on. So you can educate yourself on this. This isn't a big, you know, secret. Shh, don't tell anybody mystery. It's like the information is out there. Mayo clinic is a great resource for reading up on what the different disorders are. And, and how to treat them. So I hope that answered the question. Um, yeah, don't worry on paying them back. That whole, that whole question about, you know, paying the family back, it would be really, really good um, to just not allow them to use that as an excuse to manipulate you, you know, just always be busy, have something else going on. Uh, okay. Uh, oh my goodness. And I just lost where I was. Oh, I hate it when this happens. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. You can pay them over time. Yeah, absolutely. And I would, I absolutely would. It's like when I get the feeling like somebody is going to try to use something against me, I'm like, no, this money is yours. Bye. -bye. Thank you very much. Okay. My children are not doing well with the narc. My nine-year-old wants to harm himself. No one is listening uh, to me when I tell them about the dark triad or NPD. I can't get anyone to listen to me. Um, if your child is wanting to harm himself, you need to get him into a therapist like ASAP. And if the dad or the ex disapproves and tries to stop it from happening, you can call CPS and file a complaint and basically say, look, my child is saying that they want to harm themselves and my ex is preventing them from getting help. This is now a neglect issue. Um, do you see where I'm going with that? So, and, and if it's a custody issue, you're going to have to revisit it in court and demand that the child be able to get counseling. So, and that's the sucky thing. So narcissist ex are really super difficult to deal with. It's like, 
You know, is it better to stay in the marriage and try to protect the kids? Not really. Is it better to get out of the marriage and then have them go over there 50% of the time? Not really. I don't like any of the options. I really don't. I think the court system is so completely fucked up. It's not even re <laughs> remotely funny. So yeah, so you need to get your nine-year-old to a therapist, ASAP. You need to get them help. You need intervention. They need tools. They need somebody that they can safely speak to. And that's going to be the sticky wicket because narcissists will want to know everything that is said. And unfortunately, as a parent, they will have the right to demand those files. Now, if you've got a good therapist, they can go, no, this is going to harm the kid and I'm not going to release it. So you need to have a therapist that's got backbone because, you know, when you have to say no to a narcissistic parent, they'll threaten every, I'm going to take you to the board. I'm going to sue you. I'm going to you know, do your worst, bitch. You know, it's, <laughs> I'm protecting the client. So do you see where I'm going with that? So you need to find a really good therapist that understands narcissistic personality disorder and also has a backbone and is not afraid to stand up to these assholes. Okay. Um, my now 17 year old son is in a toxic relationship. How can I open him up for setting healthy boundaries and feeling worthy? I was such a bad role model for this. Okay. Well, 17 years old, what you can do is you can talk to him about self-esteem. If you start attacking the person he's dating, he's going to do a Romeo and Juliet and just completely side with the abuser and go off with the abuser and want to be right. And you're wrong. So, um, I've done that before. So, you know, it's, it's not going to work. So when you try to tell somebody that, you know, this person is bad for you, they're going to be like, no, no, they're not. They're perfect. They're this, they're, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. And then they're going to spend the rest of their lives trying to prove that you're wrong and they're right. So what you're going to want to do is educate them just, you know, Hey, I was a bad role model. And, you know, here are some great books that would really help you with your self-esteem and your inner child. And do you see where I'm going with that? And you just hand them to them here, read this, but I can guarantee you if the relationship is abusive, the abuser will try to prevent them from getting help. Absolutely. You can encourage him to go to counseling. You know, he may or may not go. If he does go, the abuser is going to demand to know everything that is said you know, and there will be no privacy, guarantee it. Um, so, you know, you just talk to them. You just keep the line of communication open. Try not to badmouth the, uh, the, the romantic partner and you keep reminding him he's worthy. And that's really all you can do. And, you know, you deserve to be treated well. And I know I wasn't a great role model and here's a great book on self-esteem and here's a great book on boundaries and here's a great book. Do you see where I'm going with that? So that's what you do. Okay, why does my ex-narcissist wife continue to send me emails using our child as the reason, always making accusations, basically trying to get a reaction? I never respond. Narcissistic supply! So this is what ex-narcissists ex do, ex-abusers do, or exes that are abusers do all the time. They will claim that the email is about the child because I'm sure in some custody order somewhere, it probably said something about, you know, there will only be contact if there is a issue and, you know, and the child's needs are needing to be met or, you know, whatever. So, um, Oh, good heavens. My hair is flying all over the place. Um, so what they do is they use the kid as a pawn and they use it as the, use the kid as the excuse to contact the other partner because they're just looking for a way to poke the bear. So what I tell my clients is read through the email. Absolutely. See if there's anything that needs to be addressed. And if there's not, you don't respond to it. If there is, then you respond to it, you know, per the custody agreement, you know, you will have the child Monday through Thursday, you know, whatever. Do you see where I'm going? And at the end, you say something like, thank you for your kind. Uh, thank you for your, how did I, how did I phrase that? Um, thank you for your prompt attention to this matter. I remain, you know, and you just keep it, keep it professional, keep it very legalese, you know, no emotion. And you just do that. Yeah. They're trying to get a response. They're trying to poke the bear because remember abusers would rather have a fucked up dysfunctional relationship with somebody than no relationship at all. They're looking for narcissistic supply. So, and they're also looking for a triangulation. So that's another thing that I wanted to talk about is when you're in the family situation and you're at Thanksgiving and somebody is talking about somebody in front of them, that's a triangulation. They're trying to get shit going. So you don't ever want triangulation of communication. So if the ex is involved with somebody else, they want that supply to be able to say to their new supply, oh, look how horrible my ex is. They're a terrible person, blah, blah, blah. And then the new supply can side with them about how horrible you are. And then the attention gets taken off of the crazy ex. And nobody really figures out that the ex is the problem, not you. So that's why they do that. They're, they're, it's supply. It's all about supply and it's all about triangulation. Um, 
Okay. How do you get past all of the lying that the borderline or narcissistic narcissistic abuser did and learn to trust again? First and foremost, you learn to trust yourself. This is why I tell people when you've been in an abusive relationship, you absolutely must stay single until you have worked on your self-esteem and your boundaries, which are all kind of interconnected. And you learn to listen to your gut, not your head, not your heart. These two tell stories. These two will go, well, yes, but blah, 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 blah. But the gut is always a yes or no answer to a yes or no question. You trust your gut. Once you learn to trust your gut, then it's going to be easier to learn to trust other people because your gut will speak up. You, because we've been taught, remember, we've been groomed by family to ignore our gut. When the gut says, oh my gosh, don't trust this person. I don't like this person. We get overridden because our family goes, oh no, you can trust us. Oh no, you don't see the pink elephant taking a shit in the corner of the living room when in fact we do. And so we learn to shut off the gut and we stop listening to it because we've been told to not listen to it. So now your challenge, should you choose to accept it, is to start listening to your gut. What does your gut tell you? Once you trust that gut, no questions asked, then you're ready to start trusting other people. So that's why it takes time. That's why I say stay single, work on you intensively, intensively, you know, do the work, be willing to go to therapy, be willing to read all the books, be willing to journal, be willing to burn letters, be willing to take a look at how you were groomed. How did that family of origin affect you? How did you get groomed? When did they, who told you to not see the pink elephant in the corner of the living room? You know, you work on all of that. Once you've worked on all of that and listen to your gut and trust your gut, then it'll be easier to trust other people. Okay. I hope that answered the question. Um, how important do you think it is for a therapist to recognize CPTSD if they recognize narcissistic abuse and its effects? Hand in hand. Absolutely. Because if somebody has been abused by a narcissist, they're going to have CPTSD. There's just no two ways about that. So yeah, extremely important. Um, okay. Uh, do, 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 do. She's okay. Like clockwork. She sends a message about every 90 days. Oh my God. Oh my God, dude. I'm not even kidding you. I just had this conversation with a client like two days ago. So the funny thing of it, and with, with that clients, it, that X it's every two weeks. So yes, it's almost like they're on like this weird kind of like algorithm where it's like, Oh, no narcissistic supply time to send another email. I swear to God that it, Mm, they do that. It's like some of them are every two weeks. Some of them are every 90 days. You know, it depends on their particular peccadilloes. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, you, DJ, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, that's exactly what they do. And it is like, it's on this weird kind of weird algorithm where they suddenly contact again and try to poke the bear and try to get stuff going. So you're not wrong. Um, I thought when they discard you like trash, why continue to bother the victim when they've moved on? Oh, no, no, no. Au contraire, my dear. So they have moved on, but they still need narcissistic supply. So if they're not getting narcissistic supply from, you know, whoever, their new boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, they'll return to a former one to get narcissistic supply. So yeah, it's crazy go nuts. Um, okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, trauma therapists are great. Find somebody who specializes in trauma. You want somebody who understands trauma. Absolutely. Okay. And ask questions. You've got to ask. When you go to get a therapist, you need to ask them as many questions as they ask you. And hopefully they do ask questions, or at least they talk about what they do and you know what their style of therapy is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah. Okay. Where do we begin with boundaries? I don't desire to swing to the opposite scale, reading books, trying to navigate, but still unsure. So boundaries begin with a list of deal breakers. I know it's crazy how easy it is. And we just make it so much more difficult than it needs to be. It starts with a list of deal breakers. What are your deal breakers? What will you absolutely not put up? You know, Oh my gosh, John, it's out again. It's doing it again. Oh, wait, nope. I think it's back. Are we back? Okay. I think we're back. Okay. Um, so what was I saying? So, um, oh, no, yep, we're back. Okay, good. Um, 
a list of deal breakers. That's what you want. You want a list of deal breakers. What will you and will you not put up with? That's the start of boundaries. And then when somebody does one of those nasty, horrible things, you say, bye-bye, bye-bye now, bye-bye, and you don't allow them in your life. You know, I mean, if you want to, if you want to be nice, you can give them a warning and say, you know, hey, I'm not going to put up with us. And then if they still do it anyway, then it's like, okay, well, we're done, you know, and you just walk out. So anyway, there that is. Okay. Uh, I hope that answers that question. So start with the list of deal breakers. That's how you start with boundaries. What are you not going to put up with? What should you not put up with? You should never put up with lying. You should never put up with somebody being cruel or mean or nasty or vicious or anything else. You should never put up with betrayal. You should never put up with somebody stealing. You should never put up with lies and smearing and things like that. Don't ever put up with that stuff. That's that's all drama and bullshit. So there it is. Um, okay. All right. Um, have you seen the show fields with the kids that have congenital schizophrenia? No, I don't. I very rarely watch TV, guys, honestly. It's like usually if I watch TV, it's usually like, you know, the Dead Files or something like that because I love shows like that. Um, I very rarely watch TV and I very rarely watch TV that has to do with psychology simply because it's too much like work, you know, and I need a break. So, you know, I watch stuff that I find fun. Um, what do you think about the shot that numbs the sympathetic nervous system that controls the fight, flight and freeze? I don't know enough about it. I'd have to read up on it. Um Okay. Ooh, what is the list of questions I should have when looking for a therapist? Okay. The list of questions that you should have when looking for a therapist would be what's your modality and you want to look up what the different modalities are. So there's different types of modalities for therapy. So there's EMDR. Okay. Which is, Oh good God. I'm going to have to remember what this stands for. Eye movement, rapid desensitization. Yeah. So, and that works with trauma, but it does not work for everybody. Some people go and do EMDR and they're like, that's nice. Uh, I didn't get much out of it. So uh, there's also EFT emotional focus therapy and that's, you know, the tapping and stuff to try to help, you know, calm and, and work through the, the different traumas and things like that. Um, there is CBT, which is what I do, cognitive behavioral therapy, where that means I work on mistaken thoughts, mistaken beliefs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's so funny because when I tell somebody, listen to me now, believe me later, fear is just a thought. That's all it is. It's a thought. You can choose to accept the thought in and, and have a panic attack, or you can tell the thought to go fuck itself sideways with an unlubricated baseball bat. And then the person goes, what? It's not real? No, it's not real. It's just a thought. Could it happen? Possibly. But it's just a thought. And if we change the thinking, we can change the way we react to things. So that's cognitive behavioral therapy. Then there is DBT, which is dialectic behavioral therapy, which is basically westernized mindfulness. It's really, it's like, what are you thinking? Why are you thinking it? Where did this belief come from? What do you make it mean about you? You know, that kind of thing. Mindful. Why are you responding this way? Why are you acting this way? What's happening? Mindfulness, mindfulness, mindfulness. That's what that is. So you ask them questions like that. You also ask them, you know, it's like, do they know trauma? Are they aware of the personality disorders? Do they understand narcissistic abuse survivor syndrome, which is what everybody's got that comes out of an abusive relationship? Do they get that? Do they understand it? Do they know how to work with somebody who's been absolutely traumatized, CPTSD? Do they understand CPTSD? You know, you ask them all of these questions, you know, how much do they charge? What, how long are their sessions? Do they take insurance? Do they not take insurance? Are they willing to do a sliding scale? You know, things that you need to know. So, yeah. Um, okay. Do, 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 do. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. Um, Yes, they do try to blur boundaries. You're absolutely correct. So abusers will be sneaky, like I was talking about earlier before I got mm, cut off by stupid 
Cox Communications. Um, so what they will do is they'll be like, well, that's not very Christian of you. That was a great example. Or they'll be like, you know, you don't love me or you owe us money or you owe us obligation, guys, fear, obligation and guilt. That is not normal In a healthy, normal relationship. There is no fear, no obligation and no guilt. So they will try to find ways to make you manipulate you into doing what they want. Absolutely. Okay. Um, they do try to blur boundaries. Absolutely. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, it just jumped again. I hate it when it does that. Okay. There we go. Uh, how do I actually scare away a narcissist relative that believes he owns me? You stop all contact. There's no scaring them away. They, <laughs> they don't have that particular emotion. So in order to be scared, you have to, you know, really realize that you're vulnerable. <laughs> Narcissists don't. So um, you just go no contact. They don't own you. They do not. And you just go no contact and you have nothing to do with them. You gray rock, you do whatever. So yeah, so there's that. Um, okay, hang on a second. Um, So with stalkers, okay, so yes, stalkers do not recognize boundaries at all. And I did a, a video on dealing with stalkers not too long ago, and I can do that again if you guys think that, that would be something that would be interesting to most of you. Stalkers do not recognize boundaries. Now, when somebody stalks, you've got an obsessive compulsion going on in the head. So it's called obsessive X syndrome, but not all stalks are, stalkers are Xs. So you can have somebody stalking you that's just fucking cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and obsessive compulsive, and it's decided that you're the reason for all of their problems in their life. So um, yeah, they don't respect boundaries. And that's why you must get a restraining order. Uh, I conceal carry, you know, it's like, nope, not playing. I conceal carry. And I also have pepper spray on me at all times. So you know, you do what you can to protect yourself, but you're not always going to be 100%. And you cannot allow these people to make you live in fear. And that's what they want. Their whole goal is to make you be afraid and to make you stop living because they've stopped living. So you should too. So basically it's like, no, you do what you can to protect yourself. You take self-defense courses, you conceal carry if you can, you carry pepper spray if you can, and you file a restraining order against them. Absolutely. And then you go ahead and live your life. Because really what they want is for you to live in fear and to be terrified and like, oh, what next, what next, what next? You know, fuck it, you know, uh-uh, not playing, not, not living that way. So no, they don't respect boundaries because they are truly psychotic. When somebody gets to the point where they are stalking, the bye-bye, they didn't know here, here, because a normal person does not stalk. Hello? So yeah, there's no there there. So are they, are they dangerous? Yeah, they can be. Absolutely. You take all threats absolutely seriously. You report to the police every time they violate the, the restraining order. Absolutely. Do not play games with them. Okay. Um, let's see. Is there any way to make sure a narc respects your boundaries? No. Um, mine used to be weak. Now it's improved, but he's persisting just like the old days. I just persevere. Do I just persevere until he gets the message? You go no contact. You have nothing to do with them. Guys, you cannot change these people. I cannot say this enough. It's like, they're not suddenly going to wake up and start respecting your boundaries. They're not suddenly going to, what will happen is, is when we get stronger boundaries, the narc will eventually leave because they're not getting their narcissistic supply or they'll turn into a stalker. One of the two, you know, it's it, what you do is you cut them out of your life. You don't have to be around these people. You do not. It's a choice. And if you don't want them in your life, don't have them in your life. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, block, block them, block them on all social media, block them on your text, block them on your phone, block them on your email. You block them. You absolutely block them. And the biggest mistake that people make when we are going no contact, whether it's a romantic partner or a family or whatever, is we start checking up on them on social media. We start going and seeing what they're doing or who they're dating or what the family's doing. Stop it. Stop it. You're torturing yourself. Stop it. Stop looking at their social media. Stop looking at what they're doing. It doesn't matter. They've already told you who they are. They've already shown you who they are. And they've made it clear that they did not ever love you because they did the devalue and the discard and the lying and the cheating and the stealing. So you be done. You be done. And you live your life. The best revenge, guys. Listen to me now. Believe me later, says the woman who just got back from Hawaii. The best revenge is to live well. 
Live well. Be happy. Be you. Find you. Have your list of deal breakers. Find your joy. What makes you happy? What do you want to do? What do you wish you could have done that your abusers stopped you from doing? What would you like to do? What would make you happy? Like really happy. Go do that. Live well. That's the best thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. How to heal relationship with people unwill unwittingly used to abuse by proxy by narcissists. Okay. Abuse by proxy is when the abuser gets flying monkeys to abuse the target of abuse. All you can do is educate them, hand them books like The Object of My Affection is in My Reflection, Coping with a Narcissist by Roquel Lerner. All of these, these books are in the list on my Facebook page of We Need to Talk. Um, you know, you educate them, and if they still continue to do it, bye bye they're minor narcissists themselves. Go get them out of your life. So remember, flying monkeys are either minor narcissists, or they're just ignorant and they don't understand how abuse works. Once you have educated them and they are still participating in the abuse by proxy, be done, be done, be done, be done, be done, be done. Okay. Um, okay. Hang on. Uh, So when somebody is showing you who they are, believe them the first time. So if they've lost interest in being your support, be done, be done, be done. This is on them, not on you. So there it is. Um, and you work on you and you soothe you and you find support. You either go to support groups or you get with a therapist or, you know, you work on you. It's like, it speaks more about them than it does about you. Okay. So don't take it personally, sweetheart. It's not you. It's them. Okay. Let them go. Write a goodbye letter. Dear, dear flying monkeys, you know, fuck the fuckity fuck fuck out of fucking fuck you, you fucking asshole or whatever you need to say. And then take it out to the barbecue and burn it. Do not send it. Do not send it. Do not send it. You know, that's one way to start processing that stuff. You can do a goodbye letter for damn near anybody, family, friends, boss, you got it. Write a goodbye letter and burn it. Burn it. Do not send it. Burn it. Because sending to them is just going to give them narcissistic supply. Trust me on that one. So there that is. Um, how do I shut the nag mind when someone slights me? I seem to take it on. Oh, okay. So, all right. So when we have low self-esteem or poor self-esteem and somebody slights us, okay? And this is, this, this is what happens with people with borderline personality disorder in particularly. It becomes this huge thing. It's like, oh, this is such a slight and this is horrible and this is terrible and they're right and I'm wrong and da, da 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 So it's a matter of emotional regulation and it's a matter of soothing the mind. So when negative thoughts come up, okay, so somebody slighted you and it replays in your mind, you have a choice at this point. You can either allow it to replay and continue to traumatize you or you can go, whoa, okay, that was really hurtful. Yeah, I see it. So I'm acknowledging the thought. That was a really hurtful thing. That was an awful thing. I did not like it. However, I'm not going to invite it in for coffee. I'm not. It happened. We're done. Bye bye. Now that's different than resisting it. Okay. So what that's called is thought stopping. When you go, aha, here's the thought. It was hurtful. It was harmful. I didn't like it, but I'm letting it go. Bye bye. That's thought stopping, choosing as opposed to resisting where we go, oh my God, that thought. And I'm just going to ruminate on it for the next four days. And I, oh, oh my God, I don't want to be thinking about that, that, but that's all I can think about because that thought and da, 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 and we're resisting it. So that's all we're thinking about. So what you have to do is you have to go, okay, that was a horrible thing. That was a terrible event. I did not like it. And you know what? Bye-bye. Let it go. So that's how you deal with that. And sometimes it helps to write it out. Sometimes it helps to do a letter. Sometimes it helps to burn it. You know, you do whatever you need to in order to help that thought move along. You do not have to continue to allow that thought to beat you up. You are the master of your thoughts. Your thoughts are not the master of you. It's a choice. Okay. Um, I'm managing my borderline mom with limited contact to stay in my dad's life. Yeah, that's often what happens is that there's one parent that's somewhat functional and the other one's not, and you want to try to maintain a relationship. Um, okay, whoa, I just lost it. Okay, some siblings and I worry because he's been worn down by her and may become suicidal as we reduce contact with her. That's a sticky wicket because, you know, he's an adult. 
he's making a choice to stay. You know, if you can do things with him without her, that would be great. Oftentimes that's not possible because the abuser wants to be right there. So they know what's said. Um, you know, you could offer him to come to counseling with you on the pretext that you want to strengthen the relationship, you know, and then start talking about the issue in counseling. That's a possibility, but also be aware if he's so programmed by her, he may run straight back to the abuser and tell them everything, in which case it will be used against you. So, you know, there's no easy answer to that. You know, it, it, all you can do is keep letting your dad know how much you love him and that he doesn't have to stay miserable. But some people choose to stay miserable and you cannot fix them because you did not break them. Okay. Um, yeah. So abuse is not what people think, guys. When, when I'm talking about boundaries and I'm talking about going to the Thanksgiving dinner, for me, it was always the possibility of getting hit. But the reality of it is most abuse is verbal. It's, it's actions. It's saying things. It's not being physical. It's being emotionally abused. It's being told you're not good enough. It's being devalued. It's being discarded. It's being harmed. It's being, do you see where I'm going with that? So everybody thinks that, you know, when I talk about abuse, I'm talking about physical. Well, sometimes it is, you know, but oftentimes it's verbal. So yeah, abuse is anything that harms you that somebody is doing intentionally. That's abuse, whether it's physical, mental, or emotional. So yeah. Glad I could help. Um, okay. Can malignant borderlines have moments of clarity where they feel genuine remorse and take accountability for their actions? Okay. When they have reached malignancy and they get caught red handed with their hand in the cookie jar. Yes. They will cry crocodile tears and they will boo hoo hoo. And I'm so sorry. And I realize I'm doing all of this and it'll never happen again. And what you will notice is they will never go to DBT therapy. They will never work on themselves and the behavior will happen over and over and over and over again. Here's the reason why when somebody reach malig reaches malignancy, everything starts overlapping. Narcissism and, mal and malignant borderline start looking an awful lot like each other. Okay. And a narcissistic apology is, oh, boo-hoo-hoo, I'm so sorry, it will never happen again. And then it happens again. Or, boo-hoo-hoo, uh, you made me. Boo-hoo-hoo, I'm sorry, but. Boo-hoo-hoo, I'm sorry, you feel that way. It's not a true heartfelt apology. A true heartfelt apology is, I harmed you. I hurt you. I get it. I did that. I take responsibility for that. And guess what? It will never happen again. How can I make amends? That's a true heartfelt apology. And then you make amends. And then guess what? It never fucking happens again. Somebody who is truly not interested in a real apology, it happens again. If, if the same behavior happens again, they're not fucking sorry. Remember this. If it happens again, they're not fucking sorry. Don't buy the, don't buy the apology. That's, that's not a moment of clarity. That's a moment of being caught. Does that make sense? So if they're truly sorry, why aren't you in therapy? Why aren't you in DBT? How come you're not working on yourself? Why do you keep doing the same behavior over and over again? I guarantee you they'll blow up on you. Um, anyway, there's that. Uh, okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay. All right. Going no contact. Whoa, sorry. Uh, ah, wait a minute. Darn it. Okay, going no contact with my daughter for siding with my ex stepdad, her stepdad. I don't want her to think I'm doing silent treatment. What should I tell her? You can do gray rock. You can you can still have you know. You don't have to you know completely cut her off, but you know it depends. Is she a narcissist or is she a flying monkey? You know, and have you guys tried to sit down and work out the relationship? Just because somebody sides with a narcissist does not automatically mean that they're a horrible, awful, terrible person. It may mean that they do not understand the full extent of what is going on, you know? And in that case, that's when a good therapist would come into play to help, you know, work on those relationships. Now, if that person is also a narcissist, then no, you don't want to do that. But if it's just a child, even an adult child that sided with the ex, well then, okay, why? Why did they side with the ex? What's going on? Get a, get a therapist in there to help fix that relationship to see what's going on. If they are narcissists themselves, civil but distant, civil but distant, civil but distant. So there's that. Um, okay, good Lord, I lost where I was. So my question is, 
is it okay to stay in contact with a borderline mom just to make sure your dad is okay? My siblings seriously worry about his mental health and feel he would commit suicide. Yeah, you you can, but with the with the borderline mom, if she's harmful, hurtful, horrible, awful, terrible to be around, gray rock her as much as you possibly can. You know, you're going to have to set some really strong boundaries. Once she starts becoming abusive to you, let dad know how much you love him and walk out. I'll be back, but I'm leaving right now. You know, that kind of thing. So yeah, but if you choose to have contact, make sure there are boundaries in place. Make sure that, you know, you gray rock the mom and um, you keep letting the dad know, hey, there's options. So um, yeah, you can stay, you can stay in touch with them as long as, caveat, as long as you have your boundaries in place and you do not allow the mom to abuse you. And if you have to leave, you let the dad know, I love you, dad. I'll see you in a few days or whatever. I'll be back. Yeah, I'm just not putting up with this, you know, that kind of thing. All right. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So here's the deal guys. Get rid of the hope with them. Get rid of the hope with them. Okay. This is where people who are codependent get so messed up, like really bad. So, um, we have this hope that they're going to change. And that's the little kid hope. That's the magic thinking. That's the inner child going, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. Get rid of the hope. They're not going to change. They're not going to get better. Love is not going to fix them. It's not. You know, they would have to have an epiphany of literally biblical proportions. I'm talking like, you know, clouds parting, shining down light, trumpets blaring, you know, that kind of epiphany. And they don't have that. Get rid of the hope. Get rid of the hope. If they're willing to go to therapy and work on themselves, okay, with cautious optimism. But if they use anything in therapy against you, be done. So there that is. Okay. Um, <laughs> Narcs respecting boundaries. I can't go no contact. We have kids. I'm gray rocking and insisting on communication via emails only. Perfect. But he's still hoovering me and hoping for the best. So they're going to. So that, that's just what they do, hun. It's And it's going to last for years until he can find another supply and be thrilled with that. So um, yeah, do not have any phone conversations with people. If you're in a contentious divorce with somebody or you've got kids with them, make sure everything is an email because I can guarantee you, you're probably going to have to go back to court at some time. So yeah, it's, it's just everything in, in text or in email and yeah, they're going to continue to Hoover and yeah, they're going to try to do the whole baby, baby, I've changed. I miss you so much. We had everything we had was so great. Blah, blah, blah. Don't buy it. Yeah. They're just, uh, uh. so yeah, it, it can go on for years, guys. It's not like you're divorced from them and now suddenly they're going to go on with their lives. It depends. It depends. Some narcissists do. Some narcissists are like, well, I'm not getting, you know, they're on to me. I'm not going to get my narcissistic supply. I'm going to go find another one. And then they're off and gone. Other narcissists, Hoover, 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 obsessive X, stalking, you know, that kind of thing. And then others disappear for, <coughs> excuse me, 20 years at a time and then suddenly show back up and re-hoover. It's crazy. Hang on just a second. Starting to lose my voice. I'm probably going to end here pretty soon. Um, okay. Um, yeah, cognitive dissonance. Huge, huge. So I was having this conversation, I think, with Gwen, and uh, we were talking about Est and how in Est it's all about you know personal responsibility and this, that, and the other thing. And you know, according to Est, you should be able to live with anybody and take reversal responsibility and know that their stuff is their stuff. Well, okay, that's great in a normal, healthy world. When you're dealing with somebody who is a, uh, an abuser, they're gaslighting you. They're lying. They're rewriting history. They're fucking with your mind. They're using your mind as a playground. They're literally putting a, a uh, egg scrambler in there and going and scrambling your brains. They create cognitive dissonance. So literally, I had a woman tell me when I was in Hawaii that her abuser beat her up. And as he was beating her up, he was saying, I'm not beating you up. I'm not beating you up. This isn't happening. This is, I, didn't, I, I didn't just get done beating you up. What? That's going to mess with your mind. It is. That's called cognitive dissonance, where your abuser is telling you one thing, but reality is another. So you cannot, you cannot live with an abuser. You cannot heal in the same environment in which you have been damaged. You have to get the fuck away from them. You have to, because the cognitive dissonance is just going to mess you up and it's going to keep you stuck.
and it's going to keep you second guessing and it's going to keep you constantly going, well, they're telling you this, but you know, these people are telling you this and I want to believe this person and did it. Do you see where I'm going with that? You've got to get out of the abuse. You've got to leave the abuse in order to heal because the cognitive dissonance is huge, ginormous. And you're not going to heal as long as you've got the gaslighting and the lies and the rewriting of history and et cetera, and the abuse going on. So there that is. Um, okay. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, okay. Uh, ooh, goodness. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Good Lord. Uh, mm, 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 mm. Wait a minute. I just lost where the heck I was. Okay. There I am. All right. Um, yeah. Cognitive distance is huge guys. Everybody who's a survivor of abuse goes through cognitive distance, which is another reason why I say stay the hell out of a relationship until you are healed that that cognitive dissonance is gone and you recognize bullshit when you hear it so when somebody tries to rewrite history or you know lie about what they did or whatever your gut starts yelling at you and you go bullshit uh uh i'm not putting up with this deal breaker deal breaker deal breaker hello um so that's that um Okay. Uh, why does reliving my childhood trauma with the intent of healing hurt the body? Because we store memories in our body, body memory, body memory. So there is such a thing as body memory. So when something happens to us, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, remember the amygdala? So the amygdala tells the hippocampus, the amygdala, here's a thought because fear is just a thought. Thought comes in, threat comes in, the amygdala lights up, tells the hippocampus and hypothalamus, you know, my gosh, we need cortisol. Cortisol is our stress hormone. We start tensing up and then we stop breathing. That tells another part of the brain, oh my gosh, we need more energy. So then the adrenal gland releases all of the adrenaline. And now we're either going into a panic attack or we go into a rage attack. So we have body memory. We have body memory. So after I broke my wrist, you know, doing uh, on my motorcycle <laughs> and I went to go look at another motorcycle, I literally put my hands on the motorcycle and I had a total panic attack and my body felt like I was in the accident, just like I was, you know, six months, nine months prior to that. So um, it's body memory. So we have body memories. Our bodies remember, we store information in our bodies. Why? Because we are designed to not get hurt. It's like our little amygdala is trying to keep us safe and our body memory is trying to keep us safe going, oh, we got hurt doing this. Let's not do this again. That's not a good idea. So that's why it hurts the body. And that's why it's super important that as you are doing the inner work, the inner childhood work books, the, the, where did it go? Inner child workbook by Catherine Taylor. This is what it looks like. Go buy it. It's awesome. Um, this is why we're doing all of this work. Self-care is hugely important, hugely important. When I tell people, make sure that you are doing self-care as you are doing this work, I'm not kidding. And I'm not taking it lightly. I go and get a massage once a month, minimum because of all the work that I do, you know, it's like, I need that time to relax. I need to take care of my body. When we are doing the inner child stuff, we are recalling, literally recalling all of the trauma back up and our body is going to respond to it. So love, love yourself, seriously, get a massage, take good care of yourself, drink enough water, get enough sleep, eat good food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It is very taxing work to work on ourselves. It is because we're having to undo all of the bullshit that was thrown into our space by our toxic family and having to replace it with the positive. And it's reassuring that inner child that we're safe, that we're okay, that we're protected, that we're taken care of, that somebody's got our back and that somebody is us. So yeah, that's why it is so hard to do that work. And that's why the body starts hurting when we start working on it. It's totally normal. You're not crazy. I just want to validate that. All right. Um, uh, the dark guy was in therapy. However, he has not changed at all, which means he's with a therapist that's not very good. So there you go. Uh, and here's the thing. They're, they will stay in therapy if they can manipulate the therapist. They will stay in therapy as long as, you know, they can they can be the ones in charge. As soon as the therapist starts going, what's your what's your part in this? What's going on? Blah, 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 blah. Then they, they stop. If they find a therapist that they can pull the wool over their eyes, they'll stay because now they've got a captive audience. So, yep. Um, okay. Yes, it does. When we work on ourselves, it is like we are becoming enlightened. It is because now the blinders are off and we're aware of things. And that is the goal. The goal is to be aware. The goal is to be awake and not unconscious, not 
stumbling through life. You remember there's the four stages of consciousness. So there's unconscious incompetence where we're just bumbling through life, hitting walls and going, ow, that hurt. Why did that hurt? Ow, that hurt. Why did that hurt? Ow, that hurt. Why did that hurt? That is unconscious incompetence. Then we come up to conscious incompetence. That's when we go, oh, there's a wall there and I keep hitting it. Ow. Ooh, that really hurt. Oh, shoot. I'm doing it again. What is this about? Why am I keeping hitting walls? That's conscious incompetence. Okay. And then there is conscious, wait, conscious competence, you know, where you're like, okay, I see the wall and I'm going to avoid it. Okay. I, I have now avoided the wall. This is good. Okay. I'm aware of it. I see what's going on. Conscious competence. And then there is unconscious competence, meaning you don't even have to think about it. You just avoid the wall. So there's four stages. So as we move through those stages and become aware, it is an awakening. It is taking those blinders off and going, oh, I see stuff now. Wow. And that's what the whole goal is. That is what the whole goal is, is, is awareness. So you're not wrong. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, therapy, if if the narcissist gets with a bad therapist who is just agreeing with them, yes, they will get worse. Absolutely. Um, okay. Um, how do you deal with toxic parents as a minor? Um, you just, you try to get as much help as you can from your school counselor. Honestly, that is the best way to do it because you're a minor. And until you are not a minor, there's really very limited opportunities or options for you in the United States. Um, so that's all I can say. I'm sorry, hon. Wish I could say more. Um, okay. Uh, mm, mm, mm. So sometimes abusive parents will try to make amends, but there's always an agenda. So, um, luxury card store. That's, that's the one I'm talking about. Um, so be careful. It's like, yeah, that's great that they're trying to make an amends, but what is it? What's the agenda? What's the payoff for them really? You know, because it, okay. In AA, when we go to make amends, it's very clear that the amends is either going to be accepted or rejected. And really what it is, is us taking responsibility for our actions. And it's, it's, you know, it's like whether they accept or reject it, that's, that's on them, but at least I've taken responsibility for my actions. So it's kind of like, why is that person now trying to make amends? Is there an agenda to it? So always ask that question when you're dealing with people like that. Yeah. Child protective services. If a parent is abusive, you can, you can call them yourself and turn them in. Absolutely. That's a good, thank you. That was a great answer. Um, okay. Um, can you talk about managing boundaries regarding stress from political events? Been really feeling the Brexit crisis here, doing as much as I can, but it's affecting me more than I'd like. So when stuff goes down societally, okay, whether you're in England or you're here, you kind of have to take a deep breath. Can I do anything about it? If I can do something about it, then why worry? If I can't do something about it, then why worry? It's the Buddhist worry chart. It's like, is there a problem? Yes. Can you do something about it? Yes. Then don't worry. Is there a problem? Yes. Can you do something about it? No. Then don't worry. So you do what you can and you let the rest go. Seriously. You cannot, you cannot alone save the world. You cannot alone fix things. So what you can do is maybe volunteer with an organization or talk to somebody else about it or get into a group that has got the like-minded thinking. And then other than that, you go, there's not much I can do. Or, hey, I can rally people to vote or I can rally people to do this or I can rally people to do that. You know, but basically it's like, if you can do something about it, then do it and stop worrying. If there's nothing you can do about it, then stop worrying. There's really not much we can do, you know, when it's a big global thing, unless, like I said, you want to get involved in some political group and, and uh, take it out that way. So, and other than that, stop worrying because worry doesn't fix anything. And worry is like a prayer for bad things to happen. Think about it that way. So, you know, when global stuff happens, it's like you do as much as you can. So for example, when paradise blew up and burned down to the ground, it started threatening my hometown of Chico and I was terrified and I was in Hawaii. And so I'm like frantically calling my sister going, is everybody okay? Is everything all right? Is everything okay? You know, and she's like, everybody's fine. Brandon evacuated to his dad's. It's all good. You know, everybody's safe. You know, I'm like, okay. Um, and then it was kind of like, all right, well, 
I'm in Hawaii. There's nothing I can do about it. I do know everybody's safe, you know, in my family, at least, you know, I can't do anything right now, but I can do something when I get home. So, you know, I'm looking into where to donate because that's, I don't want to just do one of the GoFundMe's necessarily because I don't know if those are legit or not, but yeah, I'm looking into donating and, and helping and things like that. And other than that, I can't worry about it. So really it's, what can you do? Is there something you can do? Yes. Great. Then do it and don't worry. Is there something you can do? No, you're, it's bigger than you. You can't do it on your own. Then don't worry. So it's letting it go. It's, it's really, it's thought stopping, choosing and sending it down the road. So there that is. I hope that answered the question. If it doesn't, let me know. Um, okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, good Lord. I just lost where I was. Dear God. Okay. Hang on. Okay. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Um, Okay, so ooh, questions. Okay. All right, I think I blasted through most of them. Okay. Um, hang on. Oh, if a, if a therapist tells you you cannot recover from abuse, is that normal? No. So here's the deal. Abuse is going to leave an indelible mark on us. Absolutely. So, you know, Pete Walker talks about it in his book, um, CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving. So we will always carry that trauma with us for sure, but it will not be in charge of us. Does that make sense? So in other words, it's always going to be there, but how we respond to the triggers is going to change as we work on ourselves. So if they're like, oh, there's no hope, then get rid of that therapist. That's a terrible therapist. So um, yeah, you can recover from trauma. Absolutely. Is it always going to be there? Yeah. In some way, shape or form. It doesn't just poof magically go away, but how we respond to the triggers and how we respond to what we are thinking and feeling that changes. And that is what recovery is, is the difference in response rather than being automatic, unconscious response. It's going to be a conscious response. So yeah, you can heal from it. Get rid of your therapist, get a different one. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> how and why can a malignant narcissist make a quiet borderline super mean? Because they torture them. They torture them. They threaten them all the time. Um, and, and when we are around an abuser and especially a malignant narcissist, they demand that we be a mirror for them. So in the beginning, they are our mirror and then the mask slips and they become horrible and they start demanding that we act just like them. And they will do things like say that they got with somebody that was super moral and super kind and super nice. They'll say things like, well, everybody lies. You need to lie. Okay. Justifying their behavior, but also tainting this person and demanding that they become just like them. That's what abusers do. Their ultimate goal is to kill their target of abuse. It's subconscious. They don't even realize it, but that's their goal is to either soul kill them by changing them, mutating them into them or to actually kill them, you know, shoving bad foods at them, getting them to smoke, encouraging them not to exercise, you know, morally by telling them to lie, encouraging them to lie, encouraging them to steal, encouraging them to throw family members under the bus, you know, that type of thing. Um, that's why, and we start becoming our abuser. We start picking up fleas. That's what it's called. We pick up fleas. So that's what's happening. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. All right. Hang on. Okay. So what we do, so Rodrigo, here's, here's the answer to your question. Um, I fell for a person whose personality reminds me of the narc. I feel so ashamed. Um, how dare I feels like I haven't learned the lesson. Okay. So here's the deal. When we are groomed by parents that are toxic. So here's the toxic parents. What we do as adults, the inner child's the one doing the picking. That's why you got to work on the inner child. And we turn outward and we go, Oh, here's somebody who reminds me 
of this narcissist. So if I can make this person over here love me, I will prove this person wrong. So what you do though, is you got half a shit sandwich, half a shit sandwich, <clears throat> total shit sandwich. So it's because the inner child is doing the picking. You have not worked on the inner child. That needs to be addressed. Why are you going for that type of personality? What is the inner child trying to accomplish? That's what you got to work on. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah, it is hard watching your country go down the toilet. It is. But what you do is you do what you can, and then you let it go. Seriously. And then eventually things do right themselves. Please, God. So there it is. Um, how to deal with threats. You take them seriously. If somebody is threatening you, okay, you get a restraining order. You absolutely you file a police report. If it's in, in text or whatever, you file a police report. You do not put up with bullshit. If they are threatening to harm themselves, you call crisis on them and send crisis out there. I can guarantee you they'll spend one night in County and they'll never do it again. So that's what you do. You take threats seriously. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Um, do politics cause cognitive dissonance? Yes. When somebody is saying black is white and green is yellow and up is down. And uh, you know, this is that way when you're sitting there going, uh, that's not true. That's called cognitive dissonance. You're recognizing it. Good job. Um, okay. Uh, I'm struggling to have a relationship with women because of my relationship with my malignant BPD mom, who I'm no contact with any advice. Yeah. Get with a good therapist, start working on you and start recognizing that not everybody is your mom. That's the thing. And that's hard to do because again, it's working on you, working on you, working on you. So you really, you yourselves are the key to having healthy relationships. It's working on that self-esteem, working on that boundaries, what you will and will not put up with. Exactly. And, and trusting your gut and not listening to your head or your heart, listen to your gut. So Anyway, okay, guys, I think I'm going to call it good for today. So have a wonderful, wonderful week. Um, next week, I'm not quite sure what the topic will be. I had one in my head, and then I totally lost it. So I'll think about it, and then I'll post it. So or if there is a topic that I have not hit on, and you guys want me to discuss, or if I hit on it a long time ago, and you want me to discuss it, let me know. Just shoot me an IM. And that would be great. Also, reminder, Tacoma, December 1st, go to Eventbrite, Mercury Eventbrite. Sign up for that. If you're interested in buying the books, they are available on Amazon. If you're interested in buying this lovely 20-ounce mug, it is available on eBay. Um, and that is it. Have a great, great week, guys. Have a good Thanksgiving. Please do take good care of yourselves. If something goes south, leave. You're not a tree. You're not rooted. You can leave. So do honor yourself and do honor your uh, deal breaker list. So, all right, there it is. All right, love you guys. Talk to you later. Bye.